I'm Jared Werham, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of The Cattle Call. Today, I'm uh, happy to be in Campbellton, Texas, just a little bit way south of uh, San Antonio with Philip Tom, the fifth generation on the ranch here, established in 1857. Uh, it's got a really cool history, but uh, we probably won't go into so much of that today, but you can check it out on our website. Uh, there is actually quite a bit of, if you're a, a Western historical kind of guy and you're into, you know, as far as founding ranches and some of the heritage, uh, not only with just within Texas, but of the West and, uh, you know, maybe the history of the Texas Rangers and some of how the, the, the ranch here came to be, uh, check that out for sure. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is something that, uh, you know, cattle men and cattle women and people that aren't in the cattle industry uh, enjoy, which is big game hunting and its relevance and uh, to profit centers and diversification of economic uh, uh, revenue on ranches today. Uh, a lot of you know guys think that ranches are traditionally just uh, we're going to have cattle or we're going to uh, graze uh, uh, you know custom stockers or we're going to have a feedlot or we're going to do this. Uh, but but a big part of the diversification process of ranches is being able to take advantage of the natural resources and uh, big game hunting is a large part of that. And you guys have uh, kind of developed that and I'll let you kind of start telling us a little bit about uh, when that started and maybe kind of fill us in about you know, what percentage of your revenue has kind of grown out of that, and it's, it's kind of considerable. So uh, sure. in addition to your feedlot and your cow herds, now you have some other revenue stream. Yes, it's a very important revenue stream for us, and most people in Texas too. Um, <clears throat> the uh, recreational hunting, it's always been around, um, but it probably took a real big jump in the mid-80s uh, when I think what happens is a lot of people used to grow up in rural areas and they end up moving to more urban areas, Houston, San Antonio, bigger cities, and they miss the times that they had to hunt and whatnot. So that stream has is, is really grown with the boom of the urban population and people trying to get out and get back into the wilderness. So uh, what we did was in the mid 80s, we went in and started high fencing uh, some of our land. Um, we probably had it all high fenced by the early 90s um, and what that allows us to do is to manage our deer population a little better so we can be a little more strict on our culling and improve the genetics a little bit faster versus having everything um, free roam and not necessarily being able to control what neighbors uh, harvest off their place uh, affecting us so <clears throat> uh, now in the last probably 15 to 20 years that business has really really boomed and so now we added a few extra things we run what they call some dmp pins which are basically it's a deer managed <coughs> permit uh, we're able to trap 20 does and the best buck we can find and put them in a five acre pen and hold them through the breeding season so that we make sure that those 20 does get bred by that buck it's very similar to running cattle you want the best genetics you know out there that you can get and so this is a way to kind of isolate those does and keep them from getting bred by inferior deer it also allows us <clears throat> because we have a, what they call an mld permit so we're not necessarily under the uh, regular hunting season guidelines it extends our season out so we're able to cull inferior deer earlier before they breed and also extends our season so that we have more time to keep the numbers down uh, because it's no different than Livestock, you know, there's a stocking rate on these deer too. And so, you know, by running stand counts, helicopter surveys and all that stuff, we're able to kind of determine how many animals are, are out there and determine what the, um, the appropriate amount for that particular acreage should be. And then <clears throat> that also allows uh, the deer to improve at a faster rate and not have to compete so much with each other obviously increases the value of, of somebody wanting to come in here and harvest a deer. You bet. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> makes that experience uh, from, from start to finish uh, a much better process and, and, and product and therefore adds quite a bit of value to, to your land as you, know, you are making use of that natural resource. So, so I guess it, it, very similar to what we do uh, and, and we're familiar with from a cattle standpoint, like you said, improving the, the genetics in your cow herd and, and using uh, whatever resources are available to, to make sure you're, you're progressing there, you're doing the exact same thing uh, as because you guys do have a seed stock herd and, and are active in that, but you're also using some of those same principles with your, with your deer population to, uh, to do that. But uh, what, uh, ha as it's grown, is it, what percentage of your, your annual revenue have you been able to in, you know, kind of, <clears throat> you know, 
you've got the cow herd and feedlot and, 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 and the, your bull and heifer development programs and those things, but uh, now you've grown this new profit center starting in the 80s. Has it you know, grown into 20% of the revenue or bigger or smaller? Is, it's probably closer to 35. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you've grown a big profit center. It's a 30-year yeah, 30, it, 30 it, income. When it, pro when it started out, it was probably somewhere around uh, 20 uh, to 25. But as we've been able to improve the uh, the, the deer herd, uh, you know, by using some of those DMP pins and some other tools, uh, you know, like for instance, you know, this would be a buck that we would use in a DMP pin, right? Because we want, you know, we like the characteristics, the mass and whatnot. And, you know, while this buck is not a terrible buck, you know, he's maybe not one that we want to breed those does. So by being able to select, you know, those on a particular place, uh, it's allowed us to make a big improvement and then to be able to generate more revenue uh, from that as well. So, Outstanding. Plus we do the, the hog, we have hog hunt, uh, you know, we have nuisance hogs like most people down in this area. And so we're able to, um, <clears throat> we generate some revenue off of that. We also use that as uh, charitable donations for uh, uh, veterans groups and youth organizations because uh, a lot of people really enjoy that. And then we have dove hunting and uh, used to have a, a lot of quail hunting, and, but the quail population has really suffered over the last decade or so, so uh, we don't do quite as much of that anymore. Fairly intensive, probably management on the quail population to keep it when you have droughts and stuff like that, I'm assuming. <clears throat> it, it is, yeah. There, there's a whole lot of factors in, into uh, why the quail population is uh, decreased, but um, safe to say there's, without actually pin raising some and turning them out, it would be really, really tough for us to keep a population here. Yeah, awesome. And these are these are sheds from the ranch, correct? These are yes. These are sheds actually from a, a breed of buck we used about uh, four years ago. Okay, and, uh, and had the had the sheds mounted. There is that's a lot. There is a lot of character, and, and of course, mm -hmm. you know, guys love the terminology with the uh, you know um, talking about the character and classifying deer and stuff like that. And then this one also from the ranch. Yes, yes. So it, it came from the ranch as well. That that one came from the ranch, uh, I believe, in the. Oh, early 80s, uh, they got him. It's, you know, part of the management too on these deer is um, allowing a deer to get old because yeah. deer don't get characteristics like, I mean, uh, pen raised scientific deer will just because of the environment they're in, but <clears throat> native wild deer running around will not get those kind of characteristics unless they have age on them. Five, six years or older? We try, we try not to shoot any uh, good bucks like these until they're at least six. Yeah. At, at that point, they've expressed their full genetic potential uh, and they're not gonna get any better. Um, and then you run the risk of, I mean, sometimes you run the risk of that deer dying early because things happen. Yep. You know, the deer are very unpredictable. It's not an exact science. It's not anywhere near like running cattle because there's so many variables that you can't control. <clears throat> but um, by allowing those deer to get that, you not only get the breeding value out of that buck, but you allow him to express his full genetic potential before you harvest him. Outstanding. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this uh, episode today. I know people love deer hunting and, and outdoor adventures, and, and uh, I think for all of us that are in agriculture, uh, specifically with, with regards to this, beef production and being able to, to take a look at your operation and your resources and say, what else can I do? To create a profit center to make my business and my family ranching operation more profitable. Uh, sometimes you just got to sit back and do that and, and uh, I think that could be applied across all areas from Texas to California to Montana and the Midwest and, and uh, just got to kind of kind of take a look and, and come up with a plan and strategy. I appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Jerry. Catch you guys later.